Welcome to the 13th episode of the Influential Wellness Preneur podcast. Today I have a very exciting guest. His name is Tom Poland and I've been knowing him for a while. I have um, actually secretly used him as a mentor. I've been getting a lot of content from him and um, I'm super excited to have him actually today on the podcast. So before I introduce him, maybe just we say hello to him. Hello, Tom. How are you? Hey, Sebastian. Yeah, thanks for having me along. It's a, it's a privilege to be here. Oh, thank you so much. It's, um, it's definitely a privilege for me too. Let me tell you that. To all out there who are listening uh, today, um, Tom started his first business at the age of 24 and um, has gone um, to sell four other businesses, taking two of them um, international. international. In that time, he has managed teams of over 100 people and an annual revenue of over 20 million. So he's definitely got around a little bit. And um, when it comes to marketing, what I know, not just with these achievements, but what I know, he really knows what he's talking about. He's also a best-selling author of um, Leadsology, a fantastic book. I strongly recommend it. The Science of Being in Demand. He's also shared international speaking platforms with the likes of Michael Gerber, of Emith, Richard Koch from the 8020 principle, Brian Tracy, and many others. So it's really fantastic to have you on the um, podcast today, Tom. And let us get right into what I always want to know. How the hell did you do all of these things? And where did it start for you? <laughs> How many hours have we got? <laughs> well, this, this particular journey really started many, many years ago when uh, I finally realized that, uh, you know, in those days I had a, an education business, we're educating business owners. And, uh, but I don't realize I was actually a marketer of those services and not just someone who provided those services. So, so in other words, it was, it was a shift in thinking from, and this is what I encourage all of my clients to do is to shift their thinking from say being, you know, I'm, I'm a, perhaps I'm a wellness entrepreneur of some sort to I'm a marketer of wellness entrepreneurial services for example. And I think the shift is, is fundamentally important because if we think the business is about, is primarily about what we deliver, then very often we open ourselves up to vulnerabilities and insecurity because we don't have a steady flow of new clients coming in. So that's, that's how Leadsology was initially born is, is I was wanting to develop marketing systems for my own business. And eventually that became so successful that people wanted to know more about the marketing systems than they did about the product I was, uh, that I was marketing. Right. Interesting. Very, very interesting. So you said with 24, what was the very, very first one that you, that you um, started? I launched a financial services business oh. and uh, that included, you know, investments such as retirement planning It included risk mitigation, such as, uh, you know, for business owners, buy, sell insurance and all sorts of stuff like that. So we, we were essentially selling financial services. Mm. Okay. It was so a you know, bricks and mortar business with people. And, you know, back in those days, there was no internet. Uh, so it was a very, very different style of marketing to what it is today. Yeah, of course, of course. So you made this change basically to um, tell, teach our people about um, marketing. Why did you make this change? Was it simply because people wanted it or is there mm. something deeper that, that drives you there? It was a bit of both, I think. Uh, it's, you know, I always talk about the specific I might need in the marketplace and you find where the need is and you fill it. So rather than coming from the point of view is this is what I want to do and I'm really good at this, that's fine, but you want to make sure that there's a need for that first and that that need is not, hasn't currently been met. Otherwise it's, it's quite difficult to do the marketing. So what I, the evolution of my journey was, was, was this, that I was teaching business owners a fairly broad range of skill sets, uh, everything from selection and recruitment of, of team members, performance appraising them, things like 360 degree um, feedback systems, um, balance scorecard, uh, marketing, of course, uh, management, leadership. So pretty much everything you needed from A to Z to actually build, start, build and grow a successful business. But I noticed a couple of things. And one of the things was that when it came to marketing and lead generation, people got a lot more interested than say when we were talking about management training. And I also noticed that I got a lot more excited about that as well. So there was clearly, in my view, there was an unmet need and it was something that, that I really enjoyed. So I think there are always two really big ticks. If you can get a marriage between passion and profit, that to me is the best of both worlds. You do the stuff that if you're going to go to work 
you might as well go and do something to earn a living that you really enjoy. And that's obviously meeting a need and serving people. Mm. Um, but, but one more evolution came after that. And that was that. So I'd have clients that maybe have a retail store or they were manufacturing yogurt uh, and shipping it internationally. Um, they might've been a consultant. But what I noticed is that I had two types of meetings happening with clients. One type was the one where I thought, oh, good. I'm going to be meeting with so-and-so. And the other type was, oh, okay, I'm going to be meeting with so-and-so. And the difference was the people that I got excited about meeting with were marketing something that was invisible. It was, it was a service, it was advice, or it was software. It wasn't a physical thing. And the clients that I could help, but it was an effort, were retailers and manufacturers. And they had a physical thing they were wanting to sell. So that's when I made the, the first switch was from offering uh, skill sets for everything in business to just doing the lead gen. And the second switch was working with everyone who had a business to just those who had a profession, you know, they, they had a service advice or software. So that's, that's kind of the long story of how, how I came to be doing what I'm doing today, which is showing professionals how to put into place lead gen systems. Yeah, very, very interesting. Well, what are some moments when you, when you do this and what, that, that really excite you? Like where you really think like now I'm my, in my element. And uh, I mean, I know I've experienced you on webinars and I know mm. how, um, how excited you are there and you can really feel that you have a passion for that. But for, for yourself, um, where... Well, the, the, the big passion for, the big excitement for me comes when I share something that I've just found actually works. You know, I, I was with a with a colleague, or not a colleague, but but a friend um, over the Easter break. Uh, at a, we were sharing a beach house together, and and he's a scientist, and he and he said, you know, the way science works is you put up an idea and then you try to destroy it. <laughs> you know, you know, you put up a hypothesis or a theory and then you try to destroy it. And if you can't destroy it, then you've probably got something that actually works. Uh, whether it's figuring out how to split the atom, or you know, whether, whether there was a black hole or whatever. That that he said that's how science works. And I thought, well, that's kind of how marketing works as well, because you discover something like, let's say, um, online funnels. And you really got to do everything that doesn't work in order to figure out what does work. And that's the process of evolution. It can be quite a frustrating and disappointing process for a lot of people. But to me, there's a lot of satisfaction in that battle, if you like, of saying, well, I'm going to get this freaking thing to work, you know, and then failing and then failing and failing and failing and failing. And I mean, LinkedIn's a classic, you know, for years, I could smell the gold in, in the LinkedIn gold mine. But for years, I couldn't figure out how to mine it. Not ethically, not without spamming people, um, not with, you know, basically being a jerk. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. Um, and then we had the breakthrough and we figured out how to generate new clients from LinkedIn without you know, spamming them or hassling people, et cetera, and without using any of my time. So that's when I get quite excited to share something like that with a client and said, Hey, look, this works. This is going to work really well for you. That, that, that puts uh, you know, that, that spins my wizard that lights up my dial, so to speak. It's, it's, here's something. And I figured this thing out and I know it sounds egotistical, but it gives me a buzz because all the courses and all the workshops that I went to, I couldn't make the darn thing to work, but this works. So I get excited about that. Especially if it's, especially if it's not mainstream, especially if it's a weird way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> very good very good that actually reminds me of what you um told me about uh, maybe almost a year ago now uh, when i asked you um we had a little session together and i asked you oh you know i have as i figured out now many problems have uh, many people have their problem that you you know this thing of self-worth and i um, keeping up and because you said if you want to fail all the time to figure something out and um, then you have to have a certain resilience to that Otherwise, yes. you can't go yes. through. And you told me what you do, and I would actually be interested if you still do it. Um, tell yourself whenever you have this feeling, in every way, every day, in every way, I'm getting a little bit better. And I'm still doing that, actually, when I get that feeling. I'm still telling this myself, and mm. I have expanded it. And, and, and kind of this is positive um, um, what do you call it? Um, it's a positive psychology. Yeah, positive psychology. It's and, and the, the little trick with that is when you have that, I call it garden variety self-doubt. You know, we all have it. Garden you know, variety self -doubt. Well, it's, it's, not, it's not massive depression. It's not massive loss of self-worth. It's just kind of 
geez, am I ever going to figure this thing out? You know, will I ever get there? You know, other people seem to be able to do it. Why can't I do it? And you notice those little voices in your head. And so that affirmation is designed to build a positive psychology. But another really important aspect of that is to, when you notice those thoughts, to accept them and to say to yourself, ah, welcome, my old friend, self-doubt. That's welcome the other part of me. That's right. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's a key that a lot of people miss. They just try to kind of cement over the self-doubt and, oh, I can't, I mustn't do that. That's a big mistake because we know just like physical muscles, when we have a dysfunctional thought or a dysfunctional emotion and we resist it, it makes that thing stronger. Hmm. Just the same way if I wanted to build a bicep, which actually I don't, but 40 years ago I did to impress the ladies. <laughs> you know, you put that bicep under, you put what's called resistance training, right? You put a heavy weight on the end of your hand and you resist the weight up and down, up and down, up and down, builds the bicep. So if we have these thoughts which are dysfunctional but are not serving us and we just try to cover it up with affirmations, we make that extra, that thought comes back more and more and it comes back stronger and stronger. But if you accept the thought, Ah, welcome, my old friend. Self-doubt, welcome. A couple of deep breaths. And once you feel that intensity of that thought and emotion lessen, that's when we come out with the affirmation to reprogram it, in fact. Every, every day in every way, I'm feeling stronger. Or every day in every way, I'm feeling more confident, more clear. Because the you know, public enemy, enemy number one is, is the loss of self-esteem. And, and prisons are literally filled with people who have lost their self-esteem. And they got frustrated and they couldn't figure life out. So they tried shortcuts and, and they beat themselves up. It's the biggest club in the world is the self beaters club. So yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I love that. And I think um, that's, that's a big thing. I probably should focus more, more on this. This is this little first step, but it just got me um, and probably our listeners as well, a bit intrigued just before you said you figured out LinkedIn. So in a nutshell, <laughs> what, what, what's, what's that? All right. Well, the thing with LinkedIn is that it really defies some of the classic marketing wisdom. So the, the classic marketing wisdom is that you, I mean, Neanderthal stuff is you, is you approach someone, you say, hey, do, you know, let's say you're doing SEO services. Do, you know, I send you a connection request and Sebastian connects. The, and then the next day or the next hour, I'm going, hey, Sebastian, we do SEO. Did you want some? Did you want some? Huh? Did you? Huh? Did you? Huh? Because now we're connected. Surely. I mean, we're best buddies, right? And, and it's what I call Hugh Jackman marketing. And, you know, I, I asked my wife, who's the most irresistible man on earth? Cut a long story short, she came up with Hugh Jackman. And so I Googled Hugh Jackman. God, is he good looking? You know, I mean, I said, so I went back to her and I said, well, what if there was a knock at the door and you answered it and Hugh Jackman was there and he bent to one knee and he popped out of this little red velvet box and he showed you this million dollar diamond ring. And he said, you know, Uta Stringer, you don't know me. That's my wife's name, Uta Stringer. You don't know me, but, but my name's Hugh Jackman. Would you marry me? What would you, you do? You summoned the devil, I guess. <laughs> what, what would you do? This is a silly, really silly, silly, silly question, right? But anyway, I asked it. And, and she looked at me and she thought, and she said, well, Tom, first of all, you know I love you, right? <laughs> I think I know where this is going. <laughs> I said, yes. She said, secondly, I, I apologize in advance, but you would never see me again. You know that as well, right? I said, yeah, I figured. I mean, he can sing, he can dance, he can act. He earns a million dollars a week. Apparently, he's a beautiful guy, lovely guy. And, I, and I, said, I said to her, look, there's no need to apologize. She said, why is that? I said, well, if I'd answered the door and he proposed to me, I probably would have gone as well, and I'm not even gay. <laughs> so most people do their marketing like they're Hugh Jackman. They approach you on LinkedIn, they connect with you, and then it's wham. I'm so irresistible, you're going to have to say yes to my SEO services, right? And, and, and we're not like Hugh Jackman of the marketing world. We're more like Jack Human. And Jack Human's a real guy. He manages a Perry Perry chicken. You can go to Google and, you, sorry, LinkedIn, you can go Jack Human. You see he's in South Yorkshire in the UK and he manages, manages a Nando's chicken restaurant. So we're more like Jack Human. He, he, he looks like, he looks as bad as I do. You know, we are not irresistible. So the thing with LinkedIn is you can't do Hugh Jackman style marketing, because you are not irresistible. I'm sorry, you're not the world's best SEO and people, you know, uh, would not be, you know, fall open themselves to reach you. You got to, you got to be more like Jack human. 
and understand that people are going to have to get to know you a little bit before you knock on their front door and propose marriage. So that being said, don't do it the Neanderthal way, make a connection request and then flog your value proposition. At the other end of the spectrum, what also does not work with LinkedIn is sending them a series of say 19 messages, all of them adding value. You'd think that would work, right? I give them a great idea, and then three days later, another great idea, and another day, like autoresponders. That's basically the autoresponder system, except on LinkedIn. That doesn't work, and I thought it would, because other than the connection request, they have never signaled an interest in what I do. So now I'm sending them all this stuff, if, let's say I was doing SEO, about how to do your SEO, and in the hope they'd reach out to me and say, can we talk about you doing my SEO? But I have no idea if they're interested in SEO. So the way LinkedIn works best is in the middle of those two scenarios. And the middle of those two scenarios is to carefully pre-screen the people that you connect with. So their profile fits the likely profile of an ideal client. And then to invite them to a brand experience. Two and a half percent will say yes. So they'll, they'll for example, they'll attend, if they're in your town, they'll attend a lunch and learn where you can demonstrate how you work with clients and how you can help them, et cetera, or a breakfast meeting, or, or they'll engage in a survey, or they'll register for a webinar, 2.5% only. So the, what works with LinkedIn is this middle path where you carefully connect with people who you would reasonably suspect would be an ideal client. And then you don't propose that they buy something from you, and you don't offer them 19 different emails, you just invite them to an event. And that fairly quickly, I guess. Pardon me? And that fairly quickly, so you... The next day. Yeah. Because they'll, they'll have forgotten you within an hour. Mm. Because you're not Hugh Jackman. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're all forgettable. We're all forgettable. So, yeah. so that's what works with LinkedIn. But the way we do it is we have um, carefully selected and carefully trained contractors who do the connection requests and the invitations. Yeah, right. Very good. Very good. Tom, I'd like to um, use the last half of our interview today to talk a bit about um, creating a cut through marketing message. And that was actually the first things I um, heard from you. And that was one of the first things I took on and researched a lot. And I got so much out of that. So I would really like to dig down into that a bit more. And sure. um, usually I asked um, my interviewees for the free best there are three best pieces of advice to go to a business, but I'd like to just go a bit uh, into, into one piece of advice, which is just cut through marketing message with you. Okay. Um, and the first question, you know, um, you're saying 99% of marketing measures actually don't work. Yeah. So wh why is that? That's probably being generous, actually. <laughs> generous. <laughs> well, the, well, um, why I know that's true is from 37 years of experience and hundreds, if not thousands of marketing campaigns, some of which work, some of which don't work and then figuring out why they didn't work or did work. And most of the time it comes down to the message and the message, let's just keep the simple for sake of example, the message is what people might know as a unique sales proposition or an elevator pitch. It's that short sentence, which describes, which should describe the benefit of working with you, the benefit of the magic of the transformation. The reason uh, that that's how I know that 99% of them don't work. Uh, but the reason they don't work is almost invariably they are egocentric and introverted. So they talk about what I do. I'm a business coach. I'm a consultant. Uh, I create software. Um, you know, that's what I do. I do SEO. So it's like we're answering the question, what do you do for a living? And we're accurately answering that question, but it's not actually what is going to get cut through or motivate people to want to know more. So what needs to be in the message is it needs to be incredibly market centric and it needs to describe the transformation that occurs in the person's life or business when they work with you. Yeah. Don't totally agree with that. Um, so I remember in your, in your, in your um, webinars, um, you said there has to be a crossing point when it comes to mm. that marketing message. Yeah. That two kind of two things intersect. Yeah. The intersection. Yeah. 
Yeah. Explain so, that. so every, every lead and what I mean by lead is that a lead is someone who in my world, the booked a time to speak with you and they know what you charge. So there's no, no surprise when you say this is what I charge. They know how you work with clients and they regard you as being their best choice. And they want to speak with you about becoming a client. That's the lead. So it's very, very, very qualified, highly qualified. There's no sales ambush or anything like that. So, so all of those leads are generated when two things happen, two things intersect, an effective marketing message with an ideal client. If someone does not get a response in a marketing campaign, whether they're trying to sell a book or get people to register a webinar or get people to open an email, one of two things has gone wrong. It's either the wrong message or it's in front of the wrong person. Possibly both. More, most of the time, it's the wrong message. The message is not getting cut through and it's not motivating people. The vast majority of the time, it's in front of at least a sufficient number of people that could be ideal clients uh, to, to make it work, provided the message is right. So that's one of the first things we do with clients is we work on their marketing message. And you can see mine behind me, you enjoy a, a weekly flow of inbound new client inquiries. That's our, that's our effectively our marketing message. So that's when all leads are generated. There has never been a lead generated in the history of mankind that hasn't uh, occurred when an ideal client's been intersected with an effective marketing message. Yeah, uh, I, I, totally, I totally agree with that. And I think this is um, um, a big thing actually I see with a lot of people here that kind of, they think they have to get them all. So they mm. put out a message and then um, maybe eight out of 10 say no and only two say yes and they get upset about it or get um, discouraged by it. But I think what really hits, hits the spot for me is like it's only if the idea client and then I almost, I heard even someone saying um, you can't say the wrong thing to an idea client. And um, whereas this is a bit... Uh, yeah, it kind of can. Later on the process, but I think... Um, yeah. yeah, I think that, that that's, it's about the idea client and to yeah. actually be fine with filtering down to those. Well, m mostly finding ideal clients is not that difficult. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're on LinkedIn, they're in other people's networks, you know, they subscribe to uh, colleagues, competitors. Um, so the, the, most of the time I find the big issue is not actually finding the people, it's, it's about the message. And if I could use a quick analogy perhaps, and you will have probably heard this, but you imagine a forest that's full of sleeping bears and the bears are a metaphor for potential clients and we want them to eat our honey from our honey pot. And the honey pot is, is a metaphor for our service or whatever it is we're, we're wanting them to buy. So we've got a couple of options. We can go running into the forest with a sharp pointy stick and jab them in the bum and wake the bear up. And, if the bear's hunger exceeds its anger, we get to live. <laughs> you know, we wave the honey pot in front of them and they forget about the fact that we've just jabbed them in the bum with a sharp stick and they eat the honey. Uh, that's a very stressful way. And that's, that's, that's not a bad analogy for cold calling. Um, it's you know, the outbound style of marketing, sell, 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 sell. It's incredibly stressful for the bear and, and for you. Or you can put a honey pot outside the forest and the hungry bears will start dreaming of swimming in honey and then they'll come out of the forest and eat your honey. And that's, that's what inbound marketing does. That's what leadsology does is it creates this inbound flow because we don't know which bears are hungry. In LinkedIn, we don't know, you know, I don't know which consultants uh, uh, need leads and need lead generation. So it's better we just put the honey pot outside the forest and let them come in, the ones that are hungry. Yeah. Very good, um, yeah. Uh -huh. so, so finding the right people, there's lots of forests with bears in them. You know, that's, that's not the hard part. The hard part is getting the message yeah. right. Yeah. Basically make the honeypot looking appealing and not look like, I don't know, a, a, a pot of cucumber, I guess. Yeah. Well, that does, that's true. It's very true. I mean, I call that matching the asset to the audience. It's like yeah. I've got, you know, Monty the marketing wonder dog asleep in my office, go to sleep. He's just having a stretch. He's a border collie. And if, and if I, go at the back of our house, we're on the sand here at the beach at Castaways Beach and I find his dinner bowl and I put a bunch of flowers in it. It's, it's a hard sell, right? <laughs> but if I put steak in it, there's no selling required. Yeah. And that's what happens when you match the asset to the audience. When you get the message right, that's embedded in the asset. The asset could be a webinar, it could be a book, it could be a survey. Um, there's no selling required, it's, it's a fit. Monty eats steak, he doesn't eat flowers. So I put the flowers in front of the beehive, they're all over it. Yeah. 
<laughs> I put steak in front of the beehive, not going to happen, you know. So, so we've got to match the, the message to the audience. So talking about um, this message, um, what, what's your approach to, to um, getting this message right? Okay, so, so think of every message as having three characteristics. Every effective message is benefit rich. That's the first thing. It contains specifics. That's very important. And the third thing is it doesn't sound like anyone else's message. So it's differentiated. So if, give you an example. So a client of mine, Max, developed software for restaurants, quick service restaurants like McDonald's, Burger King, etc. So his marketing message used to be, we develop point of sale software for quick service restaurants. It's got, okay, well, that's a fair description, right? But it, it's not benefit rich. It's a description of the product or the service. Uh, it doesn't contain differentiators really because every other point of sale software developer for quick service restaurants is saying we develop point of sale software. So what, when I asked him about the transformation that occurred when his software was installed and people were trained on using it, it was pretty, pretty evident that sales went up quite dramatically. So our marketing message, his marketing message became, we increased the sales and profits in QSRs, quick service restaurants. We increased the sales and profits in QSRs by 25% within 90 days. Now, benefit rich, absolutely. Increased sales and profits. Anyone who owns a McDonald's or a Wendy's or a Burger King wants to increase sales. It's the nature of the beast. That, that's primarily what they're interested in. Secondly, contains specific, 25% within 90 days. Very, very specific. And, and by reason of the fact that it's so differentiated and so benefit rich, it's, it's sorry, so specific and so benefit rich, it's also differentiated. So that message gets cut through. If Max runs a webinar for QSR owners on how to increase your sales and profits by 25% in 90 days, people notice it. If he runs a webinar on point of sale software, people don't notice it. And so he could put a, he could, that could, that title could do well on a book cover. This is what I talk about the message. It could do well in the subject line of an email, possibly. Um, so they're the three characteristics that we need to embed in every single marketing message. Benefit rich, containing specifics of undescription, not necessarily a number or a percentage and differentiated. So when you, when you, let's say you don't really have, I mean, it, it, it's a lot about numbers. What happens if you don't really have this, reference yet do you just make it up do you like what you feel confident to to achieve with with someone like well you've, you've certainly got to have some confidence you can deliver on the promise right uh and that's as you know from you know the book leadsology the science of being in demand the first thing we look at is is the magic can we offer someone a measurable transformation now the measurement might be a number it might be increasing sales by 25 percent but it could also be something that's completely subjective like how to have a happier, healthier relationship in just 10 weeks. So there is specificity can be embedded in wording as well as numbers. 10 weeks is a, it happens to be a number, but it's not a sales increase, for example. Um, but people know when their relationship is happier and healthier, they feel that. So it's not just, you know, have a better marriage, which contains not a lot of specifics in there, uh, and I happen to know that through a lot of research I did many years ago is that um, the people who invest in relationship programs and courses, 90% of them are, guess which gender? <laughs> Not us, right? A woman. And what they want more than a loving relationship is a healthy relationship. So if you, you, you find these things out by testing and by asking people, you know, there's 10 words that could describe in this case, um, what most people would regard as a, as a pretty darn good relationship, which one, of, which one of those 10 words would most describe the relationship that you're seeking? And healthy outstripped loving by something like six to one. Mm. I didn't think it would, but I learned a long time ago not to trust my clients, what they think their clients want to hear. And I also learned not to trust myself, what I thought their clients want to hear. It's got to be tested in the marketplace. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, very good. And I think that that um, resonates a lot with um, uh, with people who are listening on on this podcast actually, because um, there's a lot of lots of therapists and they um, they have often this almost intangible um, thing that they 
um, trying to achieve with, with their clients like um, healthier relationships, but um, a healthier, happier life, gaining more energy, vitality. And I think, again, for the ideal client, that can be more valuable than 25% more. Oh, gosh, yes. Or, oh, gosh, yes. Or, yeah. Or it, it could be being pain free. Pain free, yeah. You know, for, for a physical therapist, um, it could be sleeping better at night within seven days. Now, what, what is it? What, what are the, I mean, we, we do an exercise where we figure out what are the top three motivators that, that your clients have. And we can often um, figure those out just by sitting in our common sense corner and reflecting on the commonly expressed, uh, the, what I call the FEFs, the frequently expressed frustrations in our target market. Uh, you know, I paid for this money for a physical therapist and I'm still in pain. That's a frequently expressed frustration. Uh, or the therapist want to see me for, you know, five days a week for the next 10 weeks. That's probably not a frequently expressed frustration, but I'm just making this up as I go. Yeah. Um, but what are those frequently expressed frustrations? And if we target our marketing message to that, then that, that can be pretty worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's then really about identifying those pain points that they are, that they are, that they are struggling with. Well, yeah. it's, it's, and it's not always pain points, but you know, physical therapy, very often the primary motivator is I'm in pain or I've lost agility or I've, um, my thinking is fuzzy or something like that. Um, at the premium of the market, it's more about performance than it is about pain. So I, for example, at, at one end of the marketplace that I serve, people don't have enough clients and they really need more clients to get, make ends meet and pay the bills and everything else. They have definitely pain points, um, you know, stress around getting more clients in. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, I have clients who have $3 million in business or $10 million in business or $60 million in business. And that's not, they're not in pain. They want higher levels of performance, but they ain't in pain. The people that are after performance will pay more than the people who want to avoid pain. Makes sense. Yeah. Mm. And then I get, and then obviously you have a, a appropriate different target messages and um, different ways of talking to them in your marketing. No, I, I use the same, same message. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, and, and, and not necessarily that people would um, be always able to do that, but the way, the way we work is we figure out, okay, who's the ideal client? Where's the, where's the market? Can we create a message that's going to get cut through and motivate them to want to know more? Yes or no? If, if, we, if we work, do a lot of work and we can't, then we cut that market, we segment the market and try again. And we keep segmenting the market until we've got a message that's going to get cut through and motivate them to want to know more. And you do that through, through testing on, on, online or how? Yeah. Yeah, we, we test it. And... There's, there's four levels to the testing of a marketing message. One is, my client just sits in the common sense corner and do what I suggested, you know, frequently express frustrations, frequently ask questions. They just kind of go, okay, what, what, are the, what are the biggest needs? What are the biggest motivators for my clients? And, and normally they can come up with two or three pretty quickly. Um, the next test is they form a statement, a customer value statement. I call them marketing message, USP, whatever you want. And, and they imagine themselves at a dinner party next to an ideal client who's had one too many glasses of red wine and they're pouring out all about their problems and opportunities. You know, they're, they're, they've got pretty loose lips. And um, then they put the glass down. They go, look, I'm very sorry, Sebastian. I've been telling you all about my life, my business, whatever. What is it you do? And by that stage, you know that they're an ideal client, that you could help them and that they'd be prepared to pay you a lot of money, which is really cool. And you imagine yourself answering the question with this customer value statement. And you imagine what their reaction would be. Because if the reaction is what we want, they'll sit forward, they'll open their eyes and I go, oh, how do you do that? You know, if, if Max had been sitting next to someone who owned six McDonald's outlets and, he's, and they said, you know, they've been complaining about sales flatlining and they said, well, what do you do for a living? And they, funny you should ask, we increase sales and profits in quick service restaurants by 25% within 90 days. They go, oh, how do you do that? Bingo. So if it passed that second test, then we create three distinct variations of that. We take it to 10 people who are represent ideal clients, past, present or future. And we ask them to pick the one that most motivates them to want to know more. 60%, or in other words, six out of 10 or more, always pick the same statement. Always. That's, that's an almost, almost always. That's I'd, say, I'd say 95 times out of 100. But, but we've got to make the statements quite different. 
Yeah. Otherwise, it, it, what we want after here is we're after a polarization. We, we, want, we want a statement where people either, if they like it, they love it. And if they don't like it, they go, eh, go away. We want that polarization. We don't want it to appeal to everyone. Yeah. The, the, moment, we, the moment we get it to the point where everyone, everyone likes it, no one loves it. Yeah, of course. You want to get people off the fence. Yes, absolutely. What I call black jelly bean. Mm. Oh, that's right. right. Black jelly beans, you love them or you hate them. Yeah. 50% of audiences I've surveyed this time and time again, put your hand up, do you like black jelly beans? Okay. 50%. Yep. I love black jelly beans. And so got a bowl of jelly beans. I'll be the guy picking out the black ones because I don't want the green ones, the yellow ones, the red ones. I just want the black ones. Um, and so when you come up with a marketing message, we want it to be a, a black jelly bean where the people who like it will love it. Very good. Very good. Tom, last question. I want to know, like, that's, that's, again, going back to a bit of to your story, I think. Um, I just popped into my mind. I'm quite, quite just curious. Hmm. For you, where, where is life going in the next five years? What, 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 are, what are you facing right now that you need to overcome? And maybe it's kind of a barrier for you for a next step. It's a great question. I, I guess the barriers are more battles around finding new lead streams, as I call them, that actually work and work really well. Um, because the game keeps changing. LinkedIn have just changed their, their uh, algorithm again. Uh, you know, we know Google does that sort of every three or four years. They come up with another panda, penguin, or whatever the update is. Um, but people's preferences change as well. And, and what worked really well stops working after a while or doesn't work quite so well. And webinars were a classic. You know, webinars used to be a terrific new client generator. Now they're okay, but a lot of people got onto the webinar bandwagon and they've kind of muddied that particular water. So for me, the challenge, that, that's, that's, I think that's the challenge, Sebastian, is, is continuing to innovate, continuing to test and fail until the test is successful and then releasing that to clients. That's, I don't think it's a new challenge. I just think, I think it's a challenge that never goes away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And people learn, you know, I, I notice how, how so many people there recognize things, especially online, they, they see if there is a, uh, they recognize a bot when there is a messenger bot on Facebook. Uh -huh. so they, start, yes. they start recognizing it. They right. understand what, what a landing page is and that I'm now being, put into a tripwire or, or yes. right? that they, they see how the functionality on websites actually um, yeah. means to so, something. So now, you know, you register for a webinar and you get an email from the host two days later saying, hi, Tom, I was looking through the list and I noticed you just registered for my webinar. I wanted to reach out to you personally. Yeah, right. <laughs> Unsubscribe button at the bottom. Yeah, you've just sent this out to like 40,000 people personally. So people are picking up on the BS, right? So yeah. don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Very good. But what's, what's, what's something that you do to um, keep on top of the game? Well, Maybe. I read a lot. Yeah. I read a lot. Um, I don't like going out much. <laughs> um, but, but in part, I suppose I find it difficult to find um, events that, that are stimulating. Um, but I, I, I read a lot and I test a lot and I write a lot and I test a lot and I write a lot. So that's, that's what I do to keep on top of the game with my, with my stuff. I really can't learn my stuff from other people. I have to be in there sleeves rolled up because I can't teach something unless, uh, you know, unless I've actually tried it and actually figured out what doesn't work and what does work. Um, most of my clients have spent thousands, if not tens of the thousands of dollars on marketing training that's never worked for them. And so when they come to me, I've got to deliver them something that actually freaking well works uh, because I'm going to charge them a lot of money for it. They're going to make a lot of money out of it, but I've got to, I want to be able to sleep well at night. So that's how I keep on top of the game by reading a lot and testing a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Tom, mm -hmm. it has been an absolute pleasure having you on this podcast. And I, I guess learning a little bit about LinkedIn and that marketing message, I think that's the two key takeaways here. Great. And um, it's, it's really immensely valuable. And um, for everyone who wants to know more about Tom, you will put all the links to Lithology, especially into the podcast notes. 
So we'll be there. Um, if you're on the vidcast, on the video cast, that will be um, now right now underneath the underneath us on, on the bottom. So um, check it out. I can just, um, as I said, I've been over the last uh, probably five years now, I think, and I first um, came across you. So I've um, been following you and um, consuming your content, and so far it has been an incredible experience. So Great. thank you so much for jumping on here. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Hope it helps people. Yeah, definitely will. For next week, please subscribe to the podcast um, so you don't miss out. And otherwise, I just say tschüss and until next time. Tschüss. <laughs> if you would like to find out more about what Tom does, head to his website, www.leadsology.guru. His website link, along with his social links, are in the show notes, so check them out. Don't forget to subscribe to the Influential Wellness Printer podcast so you don't miss an episode and get involved in our social community. All those social links are also in the show notes. We look forward to seeing you next week when we interview our next inspiring wellness printer. Until then, have fun.